The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 15. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, edited by Frank Woodworth Pine, Chapter 15. Quarrels with the Proprietary Governors. In my journey to Boston this year, I met at New York with our new governor, Mr. Morris just arrived there from England, with whom I had been before intimately acquainted. He brought a commission to supersede Mr. Hamilton, who, tired with the disputes his proprietary instructions subjected him to, had resigned. Mr. Morris asked me if I thought he must expect as uncomfortable an administration. I said, No, you may, on the contrary, have a very comfortable one, if you will only take care not to enter into any disputes with the assembly. My dear friend, says he pleasantly, how can you advise my avoiding disputes? You know I love disputing. It is one of my greatest pleasures. However, to show the regard I have for your counsel, I promise you I will, if possible, avoid them. He had some reason for loving to dispute, being eloquent, an accurate sophister, and therefore generally successful in argumentative conversation. He had been brought up to it from a boy. His father, as I have heard accustoming his children to dispute with one another for his diversion, while sitting at table after dinner. But I think the practice was not wise, for, in the course of my observation, these disputing, contradicting, and confuting people are generally unfortunate in their affairs. They get victory sometimes, but they never get good will which would be of more use to them. We parted, he going to Philadelphia, and I to Boston. In returning, I met at New York with the votes of the Assembly, by which it appeared that, notwithstanding his promise to me, he and the House were already in high contention, and it was a continual battle between them as long as he retained the government. I had my share of it, for, as soon as I got back to my seat in the Assembly, I was put on every committee for answering his speeches and messages, and by the committees always desired to make the drafts. Our answers, as well as his messages, were often tart, and sometimes indecently abusive, and as he knew I wrote for the assembly, one might have imagined that when we met we could hardly avoid cutting throats. But he was so good-natured a man that no personal difference between him and me was occasioned by the contest and we often dined together. One afternoon, in the height of this public quarrel, we met in the street. Franklin, says he, you must go home with me and spend the evening. I am to have some company that you will like. And taking me by the arm, he led me to his house. In gay conversation over our wine after supper, he told us, jokingly, that he much admired the idea of Sancho Panza, who, when it was proposed to give him a government requested it might be a government of blacks, as then, if he could not agree with his people, he might sell them. One of his friends, who sat next to me, says, Franklin, why do you continue to side with these damned Quakers? Had not you better sell them? The proprietor would give you a good price. The governor, says I, has not yet blackened them enough. He indeed had laboured hard to blacken the assembly in all his messages, but they wiped off his colouring as fast as he laid it on them, and placed it in return, thick upon his own face, so that, finding he was likely to be negrified himself, he, as well as Mr. Hamilton, grew tired of the contest, and quitted the government. These public quarrels were all at bottom owing to the proprietaries, our hereditary governors who, when any expense was to be incurred for the defence of their province, with incredible meanness, instructed their deputies to pass no act for levying the necessary taxes, unless their vast estates were in the same act expressly excused, and they had even taken bonds of these deputies to observe such instructions. The assemblies for three years held out against this injustice, though constrained to bend at last. At length, Captain Denny, who was Governor Morris's successor, ventured to disobey these instructions. How that was brought about I shall show hereafter. But I am got forward too fast, 
with my story. There are still some transactions to be mentioned that happened during the administration of Governor Morris. War being in a matter commenced with France, the government of Massachusetts Bay projected an attack upon Crown Point, and sent Mr. Quincy to Pennsylvania, and Mr. Pownall, afterward Governor Pownall, to New York, to solicit assistance. As I was in the assembly, knew his temper, and was Mr. Quincy's countryman, he applied to me for my influence and assistance. I dictated his address to them, which was well received. They voted an aid of ten thousand pounds to be laid out in provisions, but the governor refusing this assent to their bill, which included this with other sums granted for the use of the crown, unless a clause were inserted exempting the proprietary estate from bearing any part of the tax that would be necessary. The assembly, though very desirous of making their grant to New England effectual, were at a loss how to accomplish it. Mr. Quincy laboured hard with the governor to obtain his assent, but he was obstinate. I then suggested a method of doing the business without the governor, by order of the trustees of the loan office, which by law the assembly had the right of drawing. There was indeed little or no money at that time in the office, and therefore I proposed that the orders should be payable in a year, and to bear an interest of five per cent. With these orders I supposed the provisions might easily be purchased. The assembly, with very little hesitation, adopted the proposal. The orders were immediately printed, and I was one of the committee directed to sign and dispose of them. The funds for paying them was the interest of all the paper currency then extant in the province upon loan, together with the revenue arising from the excise, which being known to be more than sufficient, they obtained instant credit, and were not only received in payment for the provisions, but many moneyed people, who had cash lying by them, vested in those orders, which they found advantageous, as they bore interest while upon hand, and might on any occasion be used as money, so that they were eagerly all bought up, and in a few weeks none of them were to be seen. Thus the important affair was by my means completed. Mr. Quincy returned thanks to the assembly in a handsome memorial, went home highly pleased with this success of his embassy, and ever after bore for me the most cordial and affectionate friendship. End of chapter 15